was brilliant, wasn't it, Aylesbury? Fabulous. Where did that rabbit come from? Do you know, he even taught me a magic way of flying, like Superman. Which is pretty good, really, because it's actually time to catch up with Space Watch now. What's that? You can't fly, you stupid bird. It's easy, it's like this. Clipper, the Cutty Sark, used to sail the high seas hundred years ago or so. Some poor creature used to be dispatched up here into the rigging to sight land. There we are. Well, it was quite easy when you were within sight of land, but how did the ancient mariners cope when they were in the middle of the Atlantic or the Pacific, perhaps thousands of kilometers from the nearest land? Well, the answer, of course, lay in the sky. The sun by day and to a greater extent, the stars by night. The stars gave them a celestial chart by which they could navigate the seven seas. Even today, with radar and navigation by satellite, it's important that sailors know their stars. Naval cadets come to planetariums like this in order to learn their way about the sky. The same also applies to the men who have to pilot the space shuttle and those who had to travel to the moon. All needed to know how to navigate by the stars. But the trouble with trying to learn the stars is they keep on moving. Just as the sun seems to move across the sky during the course of a day, like this wheel here, so the stars also seem to move across the sky during the course of the night. And that can be very confusing, unless you know the reason why. The reason is the Earth's rotation. By day, it causes the sun to rise in the east and set in the west. And at night, it does the same. A group of stars appearing in the east during the evening will, by dawn, have disappeared towards the west. The cross on the globe is Britain, and the picture on the left is Britain's changing view of the sky as the Earth spins on its axis once in 24 hours. And here's part of the sky. This changing pattern shows the stars appearing to revolve round a central point as we look northwards during the course of the night. That point is our first landmark in the heavens, Polaris the fixed star above our North Pole, the Pole Star. To find Polaris, we need a signpost, the seven brightest stars of the constellation, the Great Bear. Two of those stars are called pointers. Join them up, continue the line, and there's Polaris. Polaris itself belongs to another star group, the constellation of the Little Bear. Looked at from the northern latitudes, Polaris is high in the sky. The further south, then the lower it becomes, a navigator's infallible guide. Towards the equator, it just peeps over the northern horizon at, say, Nairobi. and so to plot the northern winter sky, the most important constellation, Orion the Hunter, and its stars, including Betelgeuse, Orion's Belt, and Rigel.
From the belt, extend a line, and there's Sirius, the brightest star in our sky. Go upwards and Gemini, a double line of stars, like twins. Leave Orion's belt in another direction and we encounter Taurus, the bull. The star patterns of a northern winter. And now for some close-ups. Betelgeuse, a ball of hot gas. A giant red star, perhaps 700 million kilometers across, 400 times the size of our sun, bigger even than the orbit of Mars. Orion's belt again, and we focus on a region invisible to the naked eye, but clear through a telescope, the beautiful Horsehead Nebula. A billowing cloud of black dust that astronomers predict may grow like this. to the belt once more, and from it hangs the sword of Orion. Through binoculars, magnificent patches of misty light. A gigantic formation of hydrogen. Here's a photograph through the powerful Anglo-Australian telescope. In the circle, hot and white young stars called the trapezium. Millions of years ago, they'd have been just black clouds of dust and gas swirling amid the bigger scene. But gradually, gravity would have caused the clouds to condense. When nuclear fusion began, the stars were born fierce and youthful, to shine as we see them today. To the bottom right of Orion is Rigel. Rigel is a superstar, 50,000 times brighter than our sun, filling more space than the orbit of Mercury. Those then were the sights of Orion. Now higher in the northern winter sky to Taurus. We look at an interesting little group of stars at the top of the constellation, the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters. At first there only appear to be seven, blue and hot. In fact, there are some 250. From the surface of an imaginary planet beyond the Pleiades, this is how our sun would look. One among the stars, just visible to the naked eye. Taurus again, and its bright star, Aldebaran. Close by is the Hyades, a group of stars traveling at 50 kilometers a second. Millions of years hence, the Hyades will have passed to the rear of Aldebaran, eventually leaving her far behind. The Taurus star Zeta, and just above, we hone in on the remarkable Crab Nebula. A fuzzy patch of light, slowly but surely expanding. But go back in time, and the Crab would appear smaller and smaller. Finally, 900 years ago, it would have been just a brilliant giant star outshining Zeta. Indeed, in 1054, the Chinese recorded a celestial explosion. Today, it's become the Crab Nebula. Deep within the Crab, 20th century astronomers have made an equally fascinating observation. 
a star apparently blinking off and on. It was a rapidly rotating body so dense that a teaspoonful would weigh a thousand million tons, a neutron star. Set against the Earth, it would be the size of London. Using Orion as our familiar starting point, we head for Gemini, the twins. The twins' heads are the stars Castor and Pollux. Castor is a multiple star. A planet in this system would have six suns in the sky. Close by Gemini is the Eskimo Nebula. Through a telescope, a friendly face in the cosmos. Brilliant Sirius, bottom left, belongs to the constellation of the Great Dog. It's really two stars, Sirius A, the dog star, ten times the volume of our sun, and Sirius B, the pup, a white dwarf, just twice the size of Earth. The pup takes all of 50 years to complete one orbit of the dog. Our final port of call, Monoceros. Through a telescope, a rather beautiful view. The black cone shape on the left is a cloud of dust. Over millions of years, it'll be blown away by radiation from the surrounding hot young stars. just one vista in the panorama of the heavens, as glimpsed from spaceship Earth. So there we have it, Orion and friends. In four weeks' time, we'll be taking a look at the constellations in the opposite part of the sky. We'll be looking at a brilliant blue star plunging toward us, a giant star likely to explode, and what's left behind after a huge star blew itself to pieces about 50,000 years ago. That's in four weeks' time. Isn't that an incredible journey? Don't forget our Space Watch pack. They're going fast, but send a cheque for £1.95 to Space Watch, Breakfast B, 